Hey guys, today's mini lecture is going to be about disability in public discourse. And a lot of people don't realize that um, when you think of civil rights movements, you know, you immediately think of the civil rights movement and the fight for women's suffrage. But nobody actually has really been informed or talked about the disability movement and how it's a still an ongoing thing today and just the history behind it and how we've gotten from point A to point B. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So it's really important to understand disability before actually jumping into the history. And I found in a website and it's called disabledworld.com and it states different models of disability. And there were three models that particularly stood out to me that really helped me understand before I really jumped into um, the hard stuff. Um, and the first one is economic model. And basically this is um, defines disability by a person's inability to participate in work. So kind of self-explanatory, but um, we're gonna go over this a lot and there are many different organizations that were able to help this situation. And um, yeah, and so then the next one is gonna be moral model. And this one also is self-explanatory, but basically just refers to the attitude that people are morally responsible for their own disability. And this has a lot of controversy, controversial um, conversation. And yeah, we'll also jump into that. And then also the social adapted model. And this is basically that although a person's disability poses some limitations in an able-bodied society, um, usually the surrounding society and environment are actually more limited, more limiting than the disability itself. And this is honestly so interesting to me, the social model of disability. And basically what we just said was that it's not the person with the disability that is the problem. It is the people around and the social aspect and the, what people think it's supposed to be like. I mean, I think about as an example, um, Dr. Steyer mentioned in a class on Tuesday that in her classroom, people with disability would, nobody would ever realize that they didn't have a disability. And even the people with disability never realize that they are having to do anything different than the other people because she has formed her classroom into a safe place where you have that option and you can do what is, feels good to you and you can do what works for you. And if that's what everybody else would do in the world, instead of um, kind of like making everything have to be about, you're not accessible to do this or they're not accessible to do that, just make everybody accessibility the same and let people choose what's comfortable for them. I just think that that's really neat and that's kind of my own opinion, but yeah, I just think that's a great way to get started into the conversation. Some key concepts that we're going to cover today are going to be one, the independent living movement, which is very interesting um, and it's actually was created by college students, so that is just awesome and very relatable and just makes us think that we can do anything we set our minds to, so that's exciting. And then also, the second thing is going to be activi activism for disability rights, and that is going to mainly be focused around the 70s and the 80s, so just really how, we, how it got started. And then also, the Americans with Disability Act, which is actually still intact today and is why I and many other people are able to have the accommodations and get the help that you know people can get especially in school and college and the workforce and all that good stuff. So you may be wondering what exactly is the independent living movement and what does it have to do with disability rights? Well this movement was founded in 1960 and it was by a group of college students who attended the University of Berkeley in California and basically, the philosophy of the history of independent living movement comes from people with disabilities have the same rights, options, and choices as anybody else. This philosophy is significant because when you think about it, all these students wanted was equal access and equal opportunity to be able to do the things that other college students were doing, but they just needed that extra help and accommodation, and that's something that they weren't getting, and that is exactly what motivated these students to come together and form this movement. By doing this, the students were able to come up with a very um, effective program called the Physically Disabled Students Program, and that basically just ensured that they would have things such as wheelchair repairs, emergency or emergency care, and also financial service, which was huge for them, and this was automatically able to help them, you know, start to progress. When talking about the independent living movement, it is so important that we talk about the founder and his role in this. Um, his name was Ed Roberts, and he was born in 1935, and he passed away in 1999. So as you can see, he was able to live a long, happy life. At the age 14, he contracted polio, and because of this, he was paralyzed from the neck down. And I want to take a second and think about that with y'all. 14 is a really young age, and for that to be the age that he had to start dealing with this, 
I mean, he could have really, like, sulked in it, but instead he was able to let this be his motivator and was able to use his disability to change other people's lives for the better. Um, he also established the first center for independent living, which is kind of what we're talking about. And he also, it's important to state that even though he passed away in 1999, his example, his example continues to inspire and motivate disability advocates everywhere today still. Um, he was the founder of UC's Physically Disabled Student Program, which became the model for Berkeley Center for Independent Living and over 14 other independent living centers across the country. He was one of the early directors of CIL, and he was also the first state California director of rehabilitation with a disability. He was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, and he was a co-founder and president of the World Institute on Disability. So he really made his mark, and we still appreciate him today. And because of him, we do have so many more um, ways for people with disabilities to be able to live their lives and get the accommodations that they need today in 2020. So what exactly made this movement so unique and successful was that these people really took an independent approach when it was not easy to do so. Um, I've kind of already stated this, but they didn't have outside support and that's why this was happening. Like they were like something needs to be changed and it obviously wasn't going to be Um, laws weren't going to be created at this exact time, but because of their actions, eventually that was the case, and we'll go into that next, but just basically them sticking together, and they really created a safe haven for each other, and a place that they could constantly get support, and um, just really like every day, take it day by day, and learn new skills, and teach each other things, and it just really was a great um, community that they made for each other, and because of that, is why we are where we are today. According to an article, Rhetoric of Online Disability Activism, disabled people in the United States who make up approximately 35 million, that's one in six eligible voters, face significant structural barriers that complicate methods of civic participation such as voting and protest. Though numerous federal laws, including the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, are designed to guarantee that people with disabilities have full and equal opportunity to vote. This means despite the laws that activists have worked so hard to make, one in six people, one in six voters with disability, that's one in six, think about that, that's a lot of people, they're still not having that equal um, voting right. That brings me to my next form of activism that I really want to talk about. Um, In 2016, there was a hashtag trend on Twitter, and it was hashtag Crips the Vote. And this was to bring awareness to that one one out of six percent of people who weren't able to vote because of their disability. And this really did open people's eyes. I mean, I think about all the people that don't actually watch the news, that have no idea what's actually going on, and they finally were able to see this um, discrimination against people with disabilities and how they weren't able to actually use their freedom that we supposedly have so rich in America. Um, But anyway, and I just think that that was super powerful and it really did make a mark and it really got people talking again because nobody had really been talking much since we've had all these laws come out that are supposed to protect everybody, but in reality, that's not what they were doing. In 1990, the Americans with Disability Act became a law and this was a civil rights law and it was able to prohibit discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all forms and areas including their public life, their job setting, their school, their transportation situations, and every other public and private place that people would go on a daily today. The basis. easiest and most effective way to think about ADA is to think about the civil rights movements that we are familiar with. Um, think about people that there have been laws that have passed that people should not get people should not get discriminated on things that involve their religion or their race or their beliefs or their sex or who they love. Things are just examples and just kind of show the importance of why disability is important and why people shouldn't be discriminated because of their disability. They should be able to go out and be politically involved and make decisions and have these rights. And that is where the ADA comes in. On September 25th of 2008, President George Bush signed the ADA Amendments Act of 2008 into law. And this was huge because it broadened the definition of disability and extended the ADA's protections to a greater number of people. So kind of before this happened, yes, there was this law and yes, it helped people have rights and yes, it helped people do different things, but it wasn't exactly secure 
and there were still like a lot of different like loopholes and um, people still wasn't getting that. So that was a big part too. According to Disability and Health Overview from CDC, a disability is any condition of the body or mind and impairment that makes it more difficult for a person with a condition to do certain activities. Um, notice that I emphasize more difficult, not impossible. And that, I just want to use that to tie up today's mini lecture by saying that that is why these laws are so important. That is why the history of disability is so important and so crucial for us to understand and learn. Because although there have been movements and there have been laws and there have been restrictions and there have been political um, conversation, it's still up to us to determine how we're going to view this and how important this is going to be. Don't let your neighbor not know anything about the disability movement or no, because it all starts with us. And I just hope that y'all have enjoyed this mini lecture and I will see y'all in class.